Hey, well, listen, you might not know it, but I am the father of four kids. I got one boy and three girls, and uh, my three older kids are adulting down in L.A. and Orange County in Southern California, and um, my, uh, my last one, my baby girl, has been up here uh, in Manteca with us, and, uh, you know, I remember when she was little. We had a little routine. I would always be the one to drive her to school when she was just a Little kid, you know, four, five, six years old. Yeah, there's a picture of her. This is Sophia, my daughter. I call her Sophie. I'm the only one that's allowed to, okay? She's my little Sophie. And, uh, and I would drop her off at school, and, and she'd get out of the car. I'd be in the line with the parents, and she'd have her backpack on, and, and she'd close the door, and then our little routine was she would wave. Bye, Daddy. Love you. And I'd say, Love you, Sophie. And then she'd have her backpack, she'd walk a little bit, she'd stop, she'd turn around. Bye, Daddy! She'd walk a little bit, and I love every minute of it, right? These little goodbyes, and the parents behind me are getting frustrated. So they start honking on the horn, come on, enough of it, you know, move on, move on. So, uh, just, you know, that little goodbye thing, and, uh, and take her to Disneyland, and just love this little kid uh, so much. And you know when they're little, right? If, you're, if you've ever had daughters, the dads tell their daughters, Princess, do me a favor, never grow up. Yeah. Right? Never grow up. Just stay little. Just stay little, just like you are. Can you promise Daddy that? Yes, Daddy. I will never... I, you know what? She lied. <laughs> she broke her promise, okay? And now... She's a, you know, she's a senior in high school, and, and she's been applying for all these colleges, and, and she's, she's going to go away uh, this summer. It's just going to be me and her mom left. <laughs> what, you know, I'm going to miss her so much, and it really hit me hard uh, about two weeks ago when she was getting ready for her senior prom. Yeah. I know I look great, huh? Yeah. It's awesome. I'm kidding. But, you know, I see that picture, it just, oh, it just breaks dad's heart, you know? Uh, she's going to leave, and I'm not real great at those kind of goodbyes. Well, this morning, we are talking about Jesus' uh, goodbye to planet Earth, um, goodbye to his disciples. Um, uh, after Jesus defeated death and rose from the grave, he hung around in a resurrected state for about 40 days. And he appeared to his closest disciples and his followers to prove to them that he had defeated sin and death, that he was truly their Messiah, the Son of God. And, uh, and it came at one point, where it was time for him to leave them, to return and be reunited with his Father in heaven. So Jesus uh, took his followers and they went outside of the city of Jerusalem to a place Jesus liked to take them. That was a place you've probably heard of, the Mount of Olives. And Jesus would often go there to pray or to give his disciples some more in-depth teaching. But on this occasion, this is the last time he would take them there, and he would ascend. And let me read to you our passage this morning out, out of the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 6 to 11. It says this, So when they had all come together there on the Mount of Olives, his disciples asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, <laughs> they were still confused. Even after Jesus appearing to them for 40 days, they still didn't quite understand what the plan was. When they said, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom uh, to Israel? In other words, are you going to politically and militarily reestablish the nation of Israel here on earth? And, and, and we'll, we'll kick the Romans out. and We'll be an independent, strong, powerful nation once again under your messiahship, under your leadership. And, and we'll be like we were back in the days of King David. That's what they were thinking. 
even in the last moments that Jesus was with them before he ascended to the Father. Pretty crazy. They didn't get it then. They would get it. The book of Acts shows us that they got it. But Jesus said this in verse 7, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Okay, I, I'm not going to tell you, but I'm going to show you something really quickly, and hopefully you'll be able to connect the dots. And then Jesus gave them their marching orders in verse 8. He says, you're going to receive power. That word in the Greek, again, is dunamis, where we get our word dynamite. You're going to receive that dynamite power when the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, comes upon you, and you're going to be my witnesses first here in Jerusalem with our own people. You're going to tell them about God's Messiah and salvation through his son. And then you're going to go to Judea, the communities and cities and villages outside of Jerusalem. And then you're going to take it up into Samaria. They were half Jews, kind of a, a cross-culture situation. And then you're going to take the gospel, the good news about salvation in Jesus Christ and myself, the Lord is saying, to the whole world. He gives them the game plan. Now, at this point, Jesus didn't say any questions. I mean, if I was one of his disciples, I would be like, oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, question, question. He didn't do that, okay? It says in verse 9, And when Jesus had said these things, as his disciples were looking on, Jesus was lifted up, uh, and a cloud took him out of their sight. That cloud being the presence of, of God. And while they were gazing into heavens or gazing into the sky, uh, as Jesus went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. They were angels. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking in into the sky? Um, this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, where the presence of God is, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven where the presence of God is. So they are affirming to them the Lord will return. He will come back someday. So Jesus lived 33 years uh, in a human body. He did not give up his divine nature, but he took on our weaker human nature and he died for the forgiveness of our sins he rose again to defeat sin and death then he ascended to heaven to reunite with his heavenly father but what does what does his ascension mean for us today what does that mean that jesus has reunited with his father in heaven we're going to look at that today and i think there's some uh, some lessons there that will encourage and challenge your faith. But before we go on, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day you've given us. And we thank you for your son, for his incredible love for us, for his word, for his sacrifice for us, his compassion for us. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to your word today as we consider our Lord's ascension. And it's in his name that we pray and thank you. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Well, let me ask our first question. And I hope you have your message notes. Follow along, please. You'll get more out of it. And uh, if not, maybe you've got it on the church app, okay? The notes are there as well on the Calvary app. So the first question I want us to ask is, what is significant about Jesus' ascension? First is this, mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. Jesus <coughs> wouldn't have left if his mission hadn't been accomplished. Jesus paid for sin completely and fully when he died and rose again. So the Bible tells us this in the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 8 to 9. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, you and I, 
still doing our own thing, still rebelling against God, disobeying God, Christ died for us. That's pretty amazing right there, isn't it? Since, therefore, we have now been justified by Jesus' shed blood, how much more will be saved by him from the wrath of God? That word justified is a legal term. It means that when we put our faith, our belief, our trust in Jesus to save us and not our own works or our own abilities, when we put it all on Jesus, when we trust him to save us, that means we're justified. You can think of it, justified, never sinned. Jesus paid for our sins on the cross, and we are made righteous in the eyes of God. Now, Jesus' job on earth is finished, but ours isn't. The church still has a job to do, Calvary. That's why we gather here. That's why we come and we worship the Lord and we learn from his word and we encourage one another and then we go out. We go out, right? We go out into our own Jerusalem, into our own neighborhoods. We go out in, in, into our workplaces and places where we go to school or, or whatever it might be. We go out and we live the life. We walk the talk. So people look at us and say, you know what? There's something different in her. There's something different in him. What is that? And then we share. So our work isn't done yet. We still make disciples of all nations. Uh, the second thing that's significant about Jesus' ascension is that his majesty is restored. His majesty is restored. We worship Jesus Christ, uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, eternally existing in perfect relationship with one another. We worship one God uh, expressed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but it was the Son who left the glory and majesty of heaven and that perfect relationship with his Father in heaven and took on uh, our flesh. He humbled himself, it tells us in Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 5 to, to 10. He humbled himself, took in the, taking the form of a servant, which is you and I. Jesus took on the limitations of our flesh. That meaning that he could become tired. He could become hungry. He could get frustrated. Um... If he was cut or beaten, he would bleed. They killed him on the cross. And yet, when he rose from the dead, Jesus received this, he had this resurrected body. It was still a body. Don't doubt that. Uh, when, he, when he rose, Mary Magdalene went, went to grab him. And, uh, and, and when Thomas doubted that Jesus had risen from the dead, Jesus said, well, put your hands right here. In the holes where the nails went through my hands and my feet, or put your hand in my side where the spear pierced it on the cross. There were times where Jesus got hungry in his resurrected state. He said, hey, do you guys have anything to eat? And they fed him. Uh, so Jesus had still fully God, fully man in this resurrected body, a glorified body that could reunite with his heavenly father in honor, glory, and majesty in heaven. So the book of Hebrews tells us in chapter 1, verse 3, he, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus said to his disciples, you want to see the father? You've already seen him because you've seen me. I and the Father are one, Jesus said. He's exact imprint of his nature. And Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power after making purification for sins. And he died on the cross. Again, mission accomplished, past tense. After he did that, what did he do? He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. To sit at the right hand of the king 
in the ancient culture was to have that place of honor and authority and power and glory and majesty, and Jesus shares all of that with his Father. And that's where he is right now. Third thing that's significant about Jesus' ascension is the ministry of the Holy Spirit is released. Now, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit uh, acted a little bit differently. Uh, The children of Israel did not have the Holy Spirit indwelling within them permanently. Instead, the Holy Spirit would come upon individuals for a certain task that God might have. The Holy Spirit, uh, for example, came upon Samson and made him wicked strong, right? And and, and God used Samson's, Samson's strength empowered by the Holy Spirit, to provoke uh, idol-worshiping nations around them, like the Philistines, and and hundreds or or a thousand would come upon Samson, and he'd look around and pick up a donkey bone and kill them all. You know, he's just crazy stuff, right? Uh, Or or, or the Holy Spirit would would come upon King David. Uh, The Holy Spirit was upon King Saul, but left, because Saul was disobedient to the Lord. So we see the Holy Spirit working that way in the Old Testament, but with the coming of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit works differently. Jesus himself told his disciples, listen, I'm gonna go away. I'm not gonna be here forever with you in this bodily form. I'm going to ascend and return to the Father someday, and when I do, I will send the helper to you, the encourager, to you. In other words, the Holy Spirit to you. And and when you put your trust in Jesus, then we receive the Holy Spirit, not temporarily, but permanently. And that's good news, church. God himself indwells us to empower us, to live a life to please him, to to give us discernment, to to gift us, to serve others, to to serve him. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, In him, in Jesus, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, notice that, when you put your faith, you believe in Jesus, what happens? You receive the Holy Spirit. You're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. God says, all right, you, 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 or you, or you, or maybe you, you put your faith, your trust in, in my son Jesus, and it's, it's sincere in your belief, you're mine. And God says, I'm going to put my seal of ownership on your life. You are going to now receive and be indwelt by the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. If you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, God is living within you. The power of the Holy Spirit. Let's ask the second question. What does the ascension now mean for us today? Well, first, Jesus is interceding for us before God. Okay? Um, Maybe you've had a good friend who, you know, is always there by your side, right? Right? They, they stick up for you. They've always got your back. You ever had a friend like that? I had one, uh, I still do, but some years ago, I was a youth pastor, and one of my staff assistants, his name was Richard, and Richard was a young guy, and I was trying to encourage him in discipleship, disciple him in ministry, and, uh, and I just loved Richard. He was like a son to me. We had a great time together. We had gone through, man, the battlefields together, taking kids on mission trips in the jungles and South Africa and whatever, man. We had, we had done a lot together, and we had a close relationship, and Richard always had my back. Richard was completely loyal to me. I was his boss, but it was way beyond that. He was a really good friend, right? And Richard just, you know, he was always there. So in the summertime, um, our, our high school kids would go to summer camp. And at the summer camp that we went to, they had a paintball course. You know what paintball is? Got these guns and they doo, 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 just crank out these, these little balls. And they're filled with paint. And you get hit, right? And, and I used to 
play paintball a lot because the kids, not because they wanted me to be out there, they just wanted to shoot me up, okay? And my wife said one time, listen, honey, don't play paintball this summer, please. Don't let the kids talk you into it, okay? Because every time after summer camp with the high school kids, we would go on our own personal vacation to Palm Springs. And she said, I can't look at you with all those welts and bruises in the pool in Palm Springs, okay? It's, it's sad and disgusting. So she said, just don't play paintball with the kids. I said, okay, dear, I'll, I'll try my best. Well, we get to summer camp, and of course, the peer pressure is just too much, right? They're like, you gotta go, you gotta go, Pastor Jim. Come on, you gotta go. Oh, because you just want to spend a little quality time with me? Is that it? No. You want to light me up, don't you? Yeah, exactly. So, so I get in there, and they break you up into two teams, and, you know, and all my kids were there, so some were on the other team, and my team, and we're out there uh, playing paintball, okay? And, and I'm trying to hide and not get hit. But uh, at the end... Then they'd all gather, and uh, the camp guy that was running the game said, all right, who wants to play point blank? Point blank. <laughs> that doesn't sound very good, does it? Not when guns are involved, no. So he goes, let's play point blank. And everybody's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was, nah, no thanks. I don't want to do it. I was starting to take my stuff off. I was grabbed. Get in here. So point blank is where the two teams face each other. You're only about 20 yards apart. Okay, maybe from here to halfway in the row, not far. And you're shoulder to shoulder, and you look at each other, and, uh, and the paintball guy says, aim. And you just flat out aim straight at the opposing team, right? Kind of like in the Revolutionary War, how they used to fight. And you just, you're just pointing, and then he'll say, fire. And I get out there, and I am scared to death, all right? And, and Richard's right next to me. And, and I, what is going to happen? I am going to get lit up. Oh, my goodness. And the guy goes, aim. And I put my gun up, and I see every gun on the other side pointed right at me. <laughs> right at me. And I'm like, oh, this isn't good. And I'm like, Richard, Richard, help me. Help me. Look, Richard. And Richard goes, it's okay, boss. I got your back. <laughs> That's how he kind of thought, I got you. And all these guns are pointed at me. And the guy goes, fire! And Richard jumps in front of me, puts his arms out and says, bring it on! <laughs> he got hit by a thousand times, man. I couldn't believe it. And I'm cowering behind him. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. You know, I'll give you a raise, whatever. But uh, man, Man, I tell you, <laughs> Richard interceded for me, man. He had my back. He was there. Well, in the same way, I think Jesus has got our back. Jesus, as he has ascended, intercedes for us. Um, you know, back in the Old Testament days, it, it was the high priest of the Israelites who would go into the temple once a year into the, the holiest place, the Holy of Holies, and, and he would provide uh, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole nation. Uh, and he would represent the people before God. Well, I want you to hear this, church. No man represents believers before God. The Son does. Jesus is our, our, our mediator. He is the one that provides intercession for us. Look what it says in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 34. It says, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Now, there's couple of things there. First, we find that Jesus is at the right hand of God. And if you look at the original Greek language, you won't find the words right hand. What you'll find is the word glory. Glory. Jesus is in the position right next to the glory of God. Sharing in the glory of God. Interceding for, for us. Before the Father. What does interceding mean? It's Jesus' finished work on the cross. Drop the mic. Jesus paid it all. 
when he died and rose again. And for all of us to put our trust in Jesus, that's all we need. We're his. We receive the righteousness of Jesus. Now, we still sin every day. We still mess up. But when we put our trust in Jesus, he has covered our sins. And so we receive the righteousness of Jesus. So when God the Father looks at us, uh, if we're a Christian, he has to look through his son Jesus first before he sees you and I. Isn't that good news? (laughs) Yeah. And when he sees Jesus, you know what he sees? Perfection. Righteousness. Because Jesus' righteousness has been transferred to those of us who have put our trust in Jesus to save us. Got it? That's what's going on. He ransomed us from sin and death. He bought us back. And so the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 to 6, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all. Jesus, he he, he bought us back by sacrificing himself. He ransomed us for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. So what does the ascension mean for us? It means that Jesus is interceding for us before God. Secondly, it means that Jesus is preparing a place for us in heaven. You ever think about heaven? I love to think about heaven. The older I get, the more I think about heaven. <laughs> when Jesus ascended, he went to what the Bible describes as heaven, the place where God is. You will never find in Scripture Heaven referred to as just some psychological state of mind. Heaven is a place. What kind of place? It's a place where God is, the Father, where the Son is. That's what kind of place it is. And Jesus uh, tried to comfort his disciples, telling them that, uh, that they would go with him and be with him in heaven. And so Jesus said this in John chapter 14. Verses 1 to 3, he said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me, his son. You know, a lot of us are troubled. A lot of us go through very difficult things in life. And those folks without the Lord, their trouble is multiplied. Because they don't have the power and the help of Jesus to be with them. Jesus says, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, he's talking about heaven, are many rooms. The old King James Version said, are many mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Jesus is saying, look, I won't be with you forever in this bodily form, but when I ascend to the Father, I'm going to be working. I'm going to be preparing a place for you. I'm going to be decorating your bedroom in my Father's house. Isn't that cool? See, in in, in the ancient culture there, it was a, a, a patriarchal sort of culture, and when the kids got older and married, if they didn't have the money for their own place, uh, the dad would just add another room. And the son and bride would come in and live with them, and they'd eat together. They'd fellowship together. The point, the point was being together, right? And if you had grandkids, we'll add another room. And, and there are still cultures that are like that, not as much in America, but like my wife, uh, her family is Greek. And they're like, you know, they were like first generation Greek. And she told me a story. She said one day her cousin, uh, one of the first, you know, to make it to college, she got uh, accepted to a college out of state. And she said, Mom and Dad, I got accepted to this college and I'd really like to go. Can I go? And her Greek parents, who were raised in Greek, their mindset was, they said, Well, honey, so you want us to sell the business, sell the house, and move with you out of state so you can go to college? They go, we can't do that right now. (laughs) See, that was their mindset, right? 
uh, they were going to go with their kid because the family stays together. And I don't know what happened. Maybe they homeschooled her for college. I don't know what they did, but, uh, but they all stayed together. And that's the point. We're going to be together, and, and, um, and Jesus gonna, is going to prepare a place for us in heaven, and it's going to be uh, more incredible and beautiful than anything we can imagine or experience here on earth. Now, I don't know about you, but I think one of the most beautiful places on God's earth is only a couple hours away from us in Yosemite Valley. It is, I mean, it's just amazing. I've been going there my whole life, and every time I go in, I'm still just blown away by the creativity of God. Okay, glaciers and all that stuff, great. However God chose to make it, I'm fine with that. All right, but just the way that the canyons are carved and the water and the river and all the stuff. I mean, there's Half Dome, right? This incredible granite rock. It's just the most beautiful, the most beautiful thing. And I've, I've climbed that, that dude like 10 or 15 times in my life. And it's, it's, it's a challenge. But man, the view on top is amazing. And, and then you get to El Capitan. El Capitan uh, a lot of people love to rock climb that. You know, that's the biggest rock in the world. That's the biggest single piece of granite there is. It's just amazing how it frames the valley. And then there's Yosemite Falls that, that, that go into the valley. And there's Nevada and Vernal Falls that come in and Bridalville Falls and all these waterfalls. It's just like, this is heaven on earth. And they flow into the Merced River, which goes, it cuts through the valley, and it's, it's beautiful. And then you have the trees, and you have the sequoia groves and, and redwoods, and it's, it's amazing, right? It's so beautiful. Um, and then there's, there's the real heaven. And, and the book of Revelation tries to describe it with things that we might be able to understand in our limited human understanding. So uh, heaven is described as a beautiful city coming down out of heaven, and, uh, and the foundations of the city are laid with precious uh, jewels and stones like sapphires and emeralds and amethysts and, and diamonds. And, and in the city of heaven, there are 12 gates, and each gate is one single pearl. <laughs> That's a big clam, right? I mean, big old pearls, okay? With the 12 grades, and it says the streets are, are paved with gold, like transparent glass. I mean, try to get your heads around this. The most precious thing to human beings, something like gold, is used for tar in heaven to pave the streets. You see how amazing heaven's going to be? It's going to be incredible. And Jesus is preparing a place for us there. But the most important thing is that we'll be in his presence. One of my favorite verses in scripture is in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 to 4, where it talks about just the joy and the love and the peace and the restoration each one of us is going to experience someday in heaven in the presence of the Father and the Lamb, his Son. And it says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall, be, shall there be mourning or crying nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Wow. Wow. <laughs> How much pain 
How much heartache? How much mourning and death do we experience and endure in this life? But in heaven, the old order of things will have passed away. Isn't that an encouraging thought? Man, that makes me yearn to be with God in heaven. The final thing the, that the ascension of Jesus means for us is this, that Jesus is coming again for us. Now, it's been over 2,000 years since he died and rose again. But I believe that God's promises are still true. They're still faithful. They're still reliable. Remember what the angels said when Jesus was ascending into the sky, reuniting with his Father in heaven. The angels said in Acts 1, 10 to 11, as they were gazing into heaven, uh, he, as, as Jesus went, behold, the two men, the angels, stood by them in white robes, and they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has taken up from you into heaven, he will come. He will return. In the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, if you're interested in what's going to happen at the second coming of Jesus Christ, one place you can start is the book of Revelation. I don't know if you've ever read the book of Revelation, but give it a go. Totally confusing, but give it a go. You might figure it out. Get some commentaries, all right? Ask some folks in our church. We got some... Genius experts on Revelation around here. And um, uh, there's a lot to it, but it gives us an idea of what's going to happen when the Lord returns as the forces of evil, Satan, and his unholy trinity of the beast and the false prophet are finally defeated by the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 19. Where all sin is judged. And the new heaven and new earth come. And God's people dwell in it. With the Father and the Son and the Spirit. But you might ask a question. What if I die? Or what if a loved one in Christ dies before Jesus returns? What then? You go to be with the Lord. If we die before Jesus returns, if you're a believer, you go to be with the Lord. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 to 8, So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. Right now, you and I, we're at home in the body. So in a sense, we're, we're not at home with the Lord in his presence in heaven. However, it tells us, verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Verse 8, yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. The minute we die, when we're away from the body, our soul is reunited with the Lord. Our last breath on earth is our first breath in heaven, church. We are in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what does the ascension mean? It means that Jesus is interceding for us. He knows our hearts. He knows our minds. He knows our needs. He knows our desires. And so when we pray, Jesus represents us before the Father. He's preparing a place for us in heaven, and he's, and he's coming again for us. And that is good news.